Tonight I want to talk to you about Jesus, our Passover. He is our lamb, sacrificed for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 7, the Apostle Paul writes, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. It's interesting, and I won't go into this now, but throughout the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll find out Paul refers to a lot of the feasts that the Old Testament refers to as the Feast of the Lord, God's appointed times. But I want to just focus on this thought, Christ our Passover. And going way back to the book of Exodus, in chapter number 12, Moses was told about the Passover lamb. One of the most interesting things in the Bible that pictures the Lord Jesus Christ is this Passover lamb. And beginning in verse number one, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, interesting with the Jewish people, they say that this month, which is referred to as the month of Abib, this is the month and the day, the first day of that month is when God created the the universe. So if that's true or not, that's, it, it is interesting, but this is the beginning of months for the Jews. And verse 3 says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next on to the house take it according to the number of the souls, every man according to the eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. The first thing I see here, the tenth day of the month, that's when they were to take the lamb, and they were to keep it with them, according to verse number 6, until the 14th day of the month. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus Christ, he came riding in to Jerusalem on what we refer to as Palm Sunday, which was the 10th day of the month of Abib. Now, looking back in Luke chapter 19, the Bible is clear about there being appointed times, set times, the Feast of the Lord, there are appointed times, and certain things have to take place or have taken place, and in the future will have to take place on the feast days that God has given. But according to the Old Testament prophecy of Daniel's 70 weeks, when that 69th week was fulfilled, that is when the Lord Jesus Christ would come and be revealed to the people in Jerusalem. I'm just going to place a marker here, and I'm going to go back really quick to the book of Daniel. And look in Daniel, but I'm thinking of that verse. Daniel chapter number 9, and the Bible says in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, Unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. So we have here a prophecy that gives the very timing when the Lord Jesus would come. And Israel should have recognized Jesus as their Messiah, and Jesus did have a rebuke for for Israel, and the Bible says in Luke chapter 19, verse number 41, and this is when Jesus just had 
completed the triumphal entry. They had shouted Hosanna in the highest, and they were praising God. And Jesus said in verse, well, I'll read verse 41 down through verse 44. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave it, leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. So Israel should have known, they should have known that Jesus was there, that he was the suffering Messiah Messiah ben Joseph, that they were, but they were looking for the Messiah, the king, to take over, to set up the kingdom, but Jesus had to come and die. Now, that was hidden from their eyes, but they should have known. There, there should have been many people that realized that he was coming. I mean, there's, as you read through the, the New Testament, there were those that were looking for him, and Simeon had that revealed to him in the, in the temple, that he would see the, the Lord's Christ before he died, and several other uh, people in the New Testament as well. But with Jesus Christ rebuked them, because they should have known that that tenth day, and notice that they were to keep that that lamb until the fourteenth day. Now, why why did they have to do that? What they had to do, they had to scrutinize that lamb. From the 10th day to the 14th day, they looked that thing over because it had to be without blemish, without spot. Notice in verse number 5, your lamb shall be without blemish. It had to be a male, and it had to be taken from the sheep or from the goats. So, without blemish. So, they had to look that thing over. They paid very close attention to that lamb. Now, if you go back to the New Testament, you know, it's... If Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on that that triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, then if that was the tenth day of the month, then if you take it to the fourteenth day, that would take you to Thursday. And Jesus died on a Thursday. Now, I was for years, you know, it's I didn't even really think much about you know, what day Jesus died on. And you know, the Catholics always taught on a Friday. And I was never a Catholic, but I grew up in a, it was a branch off the Methodist church. The Methodist, uh, the pastor actually started a church and it was a Bible church. He was a very good pastor, loved the Lord, taught the Bible. But he never really stressed what day Jesus died. Now the gospel is that Jesus died and was buried and three days later he rose from the dead. And I struggled for quite some time, you know, wondering what day did Jesus really die on? I heard some people say, well, he died on a Wednesday. Others say he died on Thursday. Some say he died on Friday. Now, if you're like that, this scripture cleared that up for me once and for all. And I'm going to read in Luke chapter 24, when Jesus, this is after his resurrection, and he's meets up with the two that are on the road to Emmaus, and verse 17 says, And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Now right here you have a clear statement. Cleophas says, today is the third day since these things were done. So, we know Jesus was risen on a Sunday, 
And that's what day this is. This was the, the Sunday. And how do you know it was Sunday? Well, if you look back here, and it talks about how, look at verse 10, it says, And Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary and the other, and yeah, Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the, the apostles, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran onto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wandering in himself at that which was come to pass. And behold, two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus. The same day, the same day. And look back in verse number one. It says, now upon the first day of the week, very early in, very early in the morning, first day of the week. Now we call that Sunday. And some people have a problem with calling them Sunday or Monday. They say, well, they're, they're heathen names. Well, I don't think you have to be that petty, but if you want to call it the first day of the week, you can call it the first day of the week. I'll just call it Sunday. That's what I'm used to calling it. So Sunday, this is Sunday. And when they said, the office said about, this is the third day since these things were done. That means you, if it's Sunday and you say it was three days, this is the third day since these things were done. Well, the, since the third day since then, that would mean it have to be Thursday because you have Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Third day since that day. So pretty simple to understand. Jesus was crucified on a Thursday, which is a perfect picture. It had to be that way because on the 10th day of the month, which was a Sunday, Jesus came into the city, and from that day on Sunday, the 10th day of the month, till that Thursday, everyone eyeballed him. Everyone was checking him out. And what did, what did uh, people say about him? Well, the scripture it always sticks in my mind, back in the Gospel of John, chapter number 19, when Pilate was faced with Jesus and they had cried out to crucify him. In verse number six, it says, When the chief priests therefore and the and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Then there was, there was no fault to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ, because he was perfect. He was without blemish. And what a what a wonderful God, what a loving Savior we have, that he who is perfect would come and die for a bunch of sinners like us. So here he is, perfect, and everyone had seen him, and yet you had those that rose up to condemn him. They could not get two false witnesses to agree with what they said, because there was no charge they could lay to the account of Jesus Christ because he was truly without sin. So what a what a perfect fulfillment of the Passover lamb. From the 10th day of the month to the 14th, they observed that, that lamb. They had to make sure it was without blemish, and Jesus Christ was truly without blemish. And a male of the first year, according to, to Exodus, verse 5, chapter 12, verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. And to me, that just pictures in the prime of life. The Lord Jesus was in the prime of, of life, a young man. And yet, in the prime of his life, he laid his life down. Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. He said, I have a commandment to, to lay it down. He said, I, I lay my life down. I have power to lay it down, a power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So he gave his life for us. Now notice in verse number seven, the Bible says, and they shall take of the blood. So after they killed the lamb, they had to take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. I don't know if you ever thought of this before. But you have the two side posts, and you have the upper door posts. So that's above the door. So if you would strike it 
on the two side posts and on an upper door post. And they would take hyssop to do that over in verse number 22. It says, and you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. So that blood, when it was struck on those two side posts and on that lintel, it would literally make two crosses in blood. Two crosses in blood. That's, that's interesting that there would be two crosses for there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is the second person of the Godhead and the, the forming of the cross as that, that blood was struck on those side posts. Now, one thing, and I have a, a little note in the top of my Bible I put no blood was to be put on the threshold, just on the lintel and side post. His blood is not to be trodden underfoot. Hebrews 10, 29. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, his blood is precious blood. And if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, his blood means everything. Because it's it's the only way of salvation. There's no no forgiveness without the blood of the Lord Jesus. And when you read through the book of Hebrews, Hebrews is an amazing book. You read through the book of Hebrews, and it is filled with blood. It's the blood, the blood, the blood all over the place. And verse number 29 of Hebrews chapter 10 says, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. If there's plenty of religious people that don't want anything to do with the blood of Christ, they say, well, Jesus was a good example. We ought to try to follow his, his uh, example. Well, he's the perfect example but he is the perfect sacrifice. And without blood being shed, there's no forgiveness. And that blood was never to be put on a threshold. That blood is never to be trampled underfoot. And the way that blood is trampled underfoot is by not putting it on the doorpost and on the lentils. What a picture of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's these Israelites, they simply had faith and what God told them to do. And that blood, look in, in verse number 12, the Bible, and it notes it has to be applied. That Just that death of that lamb didn't do anything. That blood had to be applied. And they, they ate the lamb. Notice it, and I'll just, just mention this quickly here. Verse number eight says, and they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, and fire is the judgment. Jesus suffered like we can't even begin to imagine as he hung on that cross, suffering for sin, suffering. He died and suffered my hell on that cross. And if I would have to go to hell for my sin, I would have to be there for eternity. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ, who was God manifest in the flesh, is so powerful and so mighty that in what seems a short time, but but the eternal God laid on the Lord Jesus Christ the sin of the entire world, and he died in our place, suffered our hell on that cross, and shed his blood for payment for our sin on that cross. And he truly was roast with fire in the sense that God's judgment came against him. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the judgment of the sin of this world came upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And he died there for us. And you notice down in verse number 12, God says this, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And he is, he is the Almighty the all-powerful 
He is the everlasting one. And he, he's going to execute judgment against the gods, the little g gods of this world. But he definitely executed judgment against the gods of Egypt. And he showed by all these plagues. And this last one is the one that's, that's such a great picture of our Lord Jesus, the precious Lamb of God. Verse number 13 says, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So here you go. What is it? that kept the judgment of God from entering into that house and killing the firstborn of every family. It was the blood applied, the blood applied. So all you need to do is have faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus. I have a friend, his name's Dan, and Dan told me years ago, he heard Billy Graham preaching about the blood, the blood of the Lord Jesus. And for the first time in his life, this guy who was a religious guy he understood for the first time in his life it was the blood the blood the blood and he put his faith and trust in the lord jesus christ and got saved by the blood of the lamb so god will pass over he said and he will not allow the judgment to come into the house back in hebrews it's just amazing the the picture of that lamb and back in Hebrews chapter number 9. And if you look at chapters 9 and 10 in the book of Hebrews, it's just loaded with, with the blood. Notice number, verse number 11 in Hebrews 9. It says, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Notice, one time, one time the sacrifice had to be made, once and for all. And what did he obtain for us? Eternal redemption. We can have eternal life through Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And notice over in verse 22, it says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. There's no forgiveness of sins without the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse number four, or 26 says, For then... Must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Boy, that's what I'm, I'm looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm looking for him to appear. I believe he's coming some year at the Feast of Trumpets. I would guess it's 2023, but that's that's another story. But I know he's going to come during the Feast of Trumpets. And it's that simple. And it's that's another study in itself. But the Lord Jesus Christ was once offered. And if you... Put your faith and trust in his blood and his sacrifice for your sin, his death, burial, and resurrection. You will have eternal life. And when he appears, and when we're looking for him, and that rapture takes place, when we're, when we're raptured up and our bodies are changed, and we have a body like an on, like an on to the body of the, the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be without sin. And we will have our salvation complete. Last thing about this Passover lamb, it's the Lamb of God. Remember John the Baptist? He saw Jesus come and he said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Here in verse number 46, the Bible says, In one house shall it be eaten 
Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall you break a bone thereof. Now God, God's pictures in the Old Testament, those things that picture the Lord Jesus, just like Adam when he had his side cut open to get his bride, just like this Passover lamb, there was not a bone of that Passover lamb to be broken. It had to be without blemish. It had to be a male of the first year. <clears throat> and this deal with the bones not being broken, back in the Gospel of John, chapter number 19. If you look down in verse 32, <coughs> this is when uh, they were going to take and have those bodies removed because of the, the preparation that was coming. Verse 32, Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. Now Jesus had already died. And the reason they broke the legs of these other two was so they would die rapidly because on the cross, if they were able to push themselves up with their legs, they could just get another gasp of air. But if their legs were broke, they would just suffocate hanging there on the cross. And what a what a horrible death. And to think Jesus Christ, he suffered that crucifixion, but he suffered way beyond the physical pain. The Bible says he made his soul an offering for sin. He bore in his body on that tree the sins of the whole world, but the the soul, he had anguish of soul when he hung there on that cross. The Bible says in verse number 33, But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. Now these, these guys, these Roman soldiers, had no clue about that Passover. They had no idea. Just as it was prophesied in the Old Testament they would, that they would part his, his raiment. And just look back since we're close here. Uh, in uh, verse number 24, it says, They said therefore among themselves, Let us not rend it, talking about his garment, but... Cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. That doesn't mean they did this as a way of, to fulfill the scriptures. They had no idea those, what the scriptures said. But they did those things because there's an almighty God who understands everything and knows everything that's going to happen in the future. He knows he knows tomorrow. He knows a million years from now. Everything. God is so far beyond our comprehension. But these men, they fulfilled the Bible. They fulfilled the, the prophecies that were given back in, I believe that's uh, Psalm 22 that that's in. But there, there you go. They had no idea they were fulfilling that scripture, but they did it. And when they didn't break the Lord Jesus Christ's legs, they weren't thinking, oh, well, now the Passover lamb, we couldn't have any bones broken in that, so we're not going to break his legs. No, Jesus died before they came there to break the legs of, of the others hanging on the cross. And that was a fulfillment of the Passover lamb, that not a bone would be broken and what a, what a wonderful picture of the Lamb of God. And just a couple more verses just popped in my head. We'll take a look at this really quick. But just thought the difference between Christians and the unbelievers, and this Revelation, the Revelation is such a powerful book. And I tell you, the more I read it, the more I think, man, this, this isn't picturing a bunch of different things. You know, like they want to say different weapons and stuff. It's picturing exactly what it says. Now, uh, the lamb for us, and that, when that scroll, no one could open that scroll. In verse 5, Revelation 5 says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. 
And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when, they, when he had taken the book, the four, and, four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. I mean, that's right there. That's, that's shouting ground right there. He is our, our wonderful Savior. He's made us kings and priests. We're going to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ here on this earth. He's redeemed us by his blood out of every kindred, every tongue, every people, every nation. You talk about diversity. That's God's diversity. There's so many diversities of nations, and there's going to be, be people from every nation, every kindred, every tongue. And we're going to praise God for eternity, and we're going to rule and reign with him. Now, that's for the ones that put the blood on the lentil and the the, or the, on the not on the doorpost. That's the ones that applied the blood of the lamb. That's the ones that washed their their robes in the blood of the lamb. And then, for those that don't, look at their reaction to the lamb. We're praising him. We're singing songs of praise. Worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb. And then, look here. What uh, what the lost people do on the day of the Lord because of verse 14 says and the heavens departed as a scroll and it's rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bond man and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that setteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? Boy, my glad I got saved as a 13-year-old boy. Got saved, and I'm on my way to heaven, not because of anything good I did, but because of the Lamb of God that was slain. Praise God for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm, I'm listening for a shout. I'm listening to hear that trumpet and the shout, come up hither, and we'll be out of here. So, so waiting forward to that day. Can't wait. Hope it isn't much longer. If you aren't saved, if you haven't placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're religious, you're on your way to hell. You have to be born again. The Bible says being born again, not of corruptible things like silver and gold, but, but by we're bought with the precious blood of Christ. We're regenerated by the word of God. It takes the word of God. So put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank God for the Lord Jesus that he loved us and died for us. God bless you.